We have an excellent panel with us today um, who'll be sharing their experiences with beaver reintroductions, both from a farmer's perspective and a conservationist perspective. Um, so we've got quite a lot to get through. So I'm just going to get straight into it um, and introduce our first speaker, um, Chris Jones, who will share his experiences. Chris is an organic beef farmer based in Cornwall. The farm is home to the Cornwall Beaver Project, a species reintroduction and research project. So I will hand over to Chris now and I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Mary. Now I just play with the... Okay, everyone see that okay? All right, so um, Mary said, yeah, organic livestock farmer. Been here since 1960 on this farm. I have a, had beavers here since 2017, and I was one of the founders of the Beaver Trust in 2019. Excuse the gal, we've got to rattle through this to get the information across. Okay, the motivation, we had flooding in Laddock in 2012, uh, twice in a month, and then twice in a month in 2013 as well. And... Um, uh, I just felt we had to learn how to hold more water on our land to contribute to reducing that risk. We had the EA visit. They had lots of really expensive uh, prescriptions for us, but absolutely no resource whatever to do anything. Um, and uh, I basically said, well, why don't we get Beavis to do it for free? And the guy said, yeah, uh, that, that would do just as much good. And in fact, I can tell it does a lot more because the Beavis work 24, well, not quite 24 seven, but every day without overtime payments or weekends off, which I'm afraid I still demand. Okay, quickly, what is a beaver? It's a, a, a big rodent. Um, 20 to 25 kilos is a very typical range for an adult, can be up to 35 kilos. Uh, well adapted to the aquatic lifestyle, very thick, warm fur, webbed hind feet, a big paddle tail for swimming and navigation and so on. Utterly herbivorous but a, a, a kind of a specialised generalist. They eat pretty much anything that, that grows in this country, pretty much, even gorse a little bit. Um, they've got to have a depth of 60-odd centimetres of water uh, uh, to be comfortable in their uh, rivery in, in environment. They need to have a subsurface entrance to a lodge or a burrow, uh, and without that, um, they won't really be comfortable settling somewhere. And they've got this incredible ability where there's not enough water to make that water by building dams to create that depth. And this, of course, has profound consequences for hydrology. Their activity makes a lot of space for an awful lot of other nature. They're very territorial, which has implications for uh, how big populations can get. And they breed quite slowly. So when people say, oh, they'll be like rats. No, they won't. They breed once a year and usually two or maybe three kits per litter. So anyway, uh, long story short, we got together with Cornwall Wildlife Trust, uh, Ex University uh, uh, and Derek Gow, and we um, released a couple of beavers there um, in June 17. Now, I was thinking that it would be a good while before we began to see much in the way of um, impact from these animals, but I did go down on the morning of the 17th and indeed, I was correct. They done bugger all. The next day, the 18th, we saw this in the outflow from the little pond we put them in. And over the next few days, over the next week, that was a result. In other words, in the space of a week, they built a really credible dam. And uh, three weeks later, they were building the next dam downstream. And three weeks after that, the next dam, dam downstream again. So they'd already kind of captured their site within 10 weeks of being there um, and built uh, a series of four dams in the end that year and created three quite significant new ponds. And what their presence uh, did was to restore what I would consider to be an unnatural headwater, uh, gravelly bottom flowing really fast, uh, taking water and nutrients and silt down to the sea um, and turned it into something Thing like that, where we've got a considerable body of water moving very, very slowly and supporting an awful lot of wildlife and really altering the hydrology. So behaving much more like a, a big river and reconnecting that stream with its floodplain. This, this little stretch of water in front of us 
is about 15 meters away uh, from the rest of the of, of the river. It, it is they're that good at uh, uh, reconnection with floodplain. So just to give you some idea, uh, University of Exeter came down um, uh, a couple of years before the beavers arrived and installed instruments and then monitored what was going on. And um, this is just a period uh, in the year before the beavers came. You see there's a, a few rainfall events on there. The red line is the water leaving the site and the blue line is the water entering it. So if you imagine um, uh, it rains heavily, the water level rises very, very quickly entering the site. Uh, it leaves the site a little bit later. It was about 10 or 15 minutes uh, to actually transit the whole site. And then it plummets again just as quickly when it stops raining. So you get this really kind of almost uh, a series of of uh, of peaks or it looks like waves, really. Um, and they all disappear very, very fast downstream and go to Laddock where the uh, flooding takes place. Now, this picture here uh, was just 10 weeks after the beavers arrived. That's when we had our first significant rainfall at the end of that summer. And we have got that same very sharp peak of the water entering the site. But the peak has already been uh, reduced by nearly a quarter uh, of the water leaving the site. And the water levels maintained much longer. In other words, if we think about the site as a kind of water battery, before the beavers, it charged up very, very fast and discharged really quickly. And the beavers came and they began to mend the function, to fix the function of that battery. So already it's charging up just as fast, but it's discharging much, much more slowly. In other words, we're beginning to hold water in that site for a lot longer. Uh, and this is also from Exeter. This is a, a plot of uh, rainfall events, um, peak discharges uh, from the site uh, back in uh, up to the end of 2019. And the red dots are from before the beavers came. And that, that's a sort of uh, the best fit curve. And then the blue dots and the blue line, that is after the beavers came. And you can see that the peak discharge has nearly been cut in half by the presence of those beavers working in that in that time. It's an aerial view. Okay, we've got a big pond uh, uh, over to the um, the east end of the site. The water flows into that and then flows off uh, across the rest of that piece of land. Um, that water was just about welly level before the beavers came. And now this was uh, taken by some people from Manchester Uni in August. And we can see how much water there is being held on, on the site. Uh, lots and lots of water. The, the, the main pond itself is now two to three times the original area and about four or five times deep. Well, I know this because I, I, I fell out of a canoe and suddenly found I was... Uh, well over my head in water uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, and you'll notice also quite a few dead trees and so on. This is the line uh, of the uh, of the original stream, but also if you look carefully, there's areas where uh, there are ponds, um, which are still just about under canopy, but forming there, and the beavers will clear the trees away from those new ponds as well. So anyway, Altogether, uh, after six years, there are eight main dams. Uh, they've built two lodges. The original pond is, is, is quadrupled in volume. Several more ponds, lots of inundated wetland. And where there's one stream, uh, there are now four. And that's probably the biggest contribution to the hydrology is this braiding of the river. All the water that enters the site still has to leave it sooner or later, but it's now going through uh, a, a much greater distance th than before, and um, it's it's uh, got a great more, deal more friction. So now the the um, the period of time it takes on average for a flood peak to come through is nearly two hours, when before it was about ten minutes. So this is real. 
and the biodiversity change with it. Now, what about some other impacts? Okay, drought. This picture was taken in 2022, and um, in that terrible drought, the beavers actually increased the amount of water they were holding there just by putting a lot of extra mud on top of their dams. And they raised levels uh, probably about six inches everywhere. And of course, six inches over an acre, that's a lot of water. And critically, in the 2018 uh, drought and the 22 drought, we had free water we could pump out and use for other things around the farm. And who knows when the next drought is coming. We thought it was coming this year, but luckily it rained throughout the summer. Uh -huh. They make excellent fire breaks. Now, I know we don't, don't have that much wildfire in Britain yet, but I think we all know it's coming, uh, especially in the uplands. And these inundated valleys, they make excellent refuges for wildlife. But imagine if you had uh, livestock out there, there'd be something for livestock to go and hide too while the fire's coming through. Beavers and trees. Uh, beavers, lo and behold, they cut down trees. But it's really, really easy to fix that. You know, this is uh, one of our volunteers painting PVA glue and then applying sand to that on a, a nice young oak tree. OK. Beavers um, essentially only will knock down the trees that we let them knock down. We should remember we're the adults in the room here. And if the trees here we need to protect, we can do it. And I would add as well for any farmers in England, I'm not sure if this applies in Scotland, but certainly in England, under countryside stewardship, you can pay for it, you can get rather um, grants for individual tree protection and indeed for permanent crops, things like orchards. Another impact is on water quality. Now, I, I'm pointing my finger there at the depth of silt from the bottom of one of the ponds. Now, the, the, the real story is here, this silt would not have been there without the beavers. Because the beavers are there, it's not now in the oyster beds in Falmouth Bay. 12 oyster uh, farms in, in, in Falmouth Bay, all of them closed now down to water quality. If we had this rolled out at scale, we could be seeing some big uh, changes. It's quite rich in organic matter as well, so it's holding, uh, um, uh, holding carbon for us. And we recently had a uh, Cambridge University visit and they noticed a 20, sorry, an 80% drop in nitrate levels in the water uh, from the uh, entrance to the exit of the, of the site. So that's quite, um, quite interesting, I think. And again, when we can deploy at scale, we will begin to improve uh, water in our coastal, uh, our coastal waters. Fish, up to eight times bigger um, uh, on the site now. In the top pond, this is a fish we took out in September, September 22. Um, we've got 11 different bat species uh, on the site now. 11 new bird records, 17 dragonflies, and I could go on, uh, but basically the beavers have made an incredible bounce in biodiversity. And they can do that anywhere. Right, just a, a very quick snatch of video showing um, showing the site and some of it should be of a little bit of interest to farmers. Um, wait for it. There we go. We actually put cattle and sometimes sheep through the site just to be able to demonstrate to farms that there's no fundamental um, uh, incompatibility of these animals with livestock. <laughs> I think you get the picture. So we will now, what's the current status? They're legally native in England and Scotland. Slightly strange contract, I think, being legally native, but there you go. Um, but they also have legal protection in both those countries now. They are currently present in to a greater or lesser extent in about 15 rivers in Britain and there's only one of those rivers which has serious problems uh, serious conflict with agriculture and that's River Tay 
in England, uh, in England, natural England are trying to get ahead of the game. And before populations get big, they are uh, helping to set up management groups in uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, the Tamar, East Devon, East Kent, uh, the Avon, I think now as well. And there'll be more to come, no doubt, as, as beavers uh, are unrolled. And also being very proactive, the uh, natural England are running management training courses um, for uh, let's say uh, river keepers, farmers, foresters, uh, wildlife uh, operatives, conservationists, that kind of thing. So what do farmers have to fear? Okay, uh, it is my position that the severity of risk is directly proportional to the topography. If it's very, very flat, look out. If it is not flat, if it's like uh, Cornwall, which is hills everywhere and, and fairly narrow valleys, there's not really that much uh, problem that the you know, serious problem that the uh, beavers can cause. Um, and then there's everywhere in between those. In my view, and this is my personal view, we need to have lots and lots of education. We need funded river buffers because I think. Uh, our rivers are in such a terrible state now, mostly, not everywhere, but mostly, it would be a really good idea to have um, uh, agriculture step back from the riverbank uh, by a few metres, maybe maybe 20 metres, um, and they should be funded and funded well. In England, under Elms, anyway, I think that will come. Um, we need very rapid response where there are real issues and I think we should have a strategy so that we bring beavers back uh, certainly as a priority to places of low conflict and to really avoid high risk catchments wherever we can and I absolutely believe that farmers should be front and centre in contributing to that okay that's probably enough for me now thank you very much indeed for listening and uh, I look forward to questions Thank you for that, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, so we'll move swiftly now on to our next speaker, Sam Kenyon. Sam is a lowland livestock farmer from North Wales and is NFFM Wales's vice chair. Um, so over to you, Sam, and I will now try and pin you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, it's going to be hard following the Grandmaster of beavers in the UK, but thank you, Chris. Um, so I don't have a presentation just because I get really nervous being on panels and I just find it easier to talk to talk to you all. So please bear with. Um, so I'm coming at this from a different angle in that I'm in North Wales where beavers are not legally native as the term is in England, Scotland. Um, I'm on the lowlands. I've got 192 a uh, kilometre square catchment behind me. Um, I'm on the River Elwy. We've got quite a few tributaries fe feeding into that. And so when we flooded in 2020, we had three major floods in the space of a few weeks. And quite a lot of the farm was, um, was damaged. We had a lot of soil erosion. And I've only been here seven years. I hadn't been here that long. Um, and I just figured I can't rebuild the land or buy land at the rate at which it's washing away. So I started looking for solutions to protect my farm. Um, as Chris suggested, I put moved the fences back from the um, riverbank. I took the livestock off the riverbank. Um, we've done a lot of riverbank repairs and we've spent sort of tens of thousands of pounds of our own money um, repairing those riverbanks and then when we have a flood um, we can see it washing away and it, and it gets so disheartening that we that I started looking at nature-based solutions so every all the repairs we'd done I didn't included vegetation we had um, had the riverbanks scraped back to sort of instead of being vertical and they wash away underneath and then the top collapses in we took them back to like a 30 degree angle and we buried whole willow trees that we coppiced from around the farm into the banks. So I had the advice of um, a hydrologist through NRW. NRW is the Environment Agency in Wales, Natural Resources Wales. 
And I tapped into them. I found a lot of helpful people um, who wanted to see farmers delivering solutions. Um, but it, it was all governed by how much we could fund it ourselves as there wasn't a pot of funding out there for us to tap into. So I had all this vegetation um, regenerating and it just seemed like something was missing. And I started looking into um, the possibilities of beaver reintroduction. I emailed Chris and was sent in the direction of um, a couple of people in North Wales Wildlife Trust who have been trying to get beavers reintroduced um, for about 15 years now into Wales. Um, I offered the farm up as a site. We have a couple of tributaries that run through our broadleaf woodland and uh, they came and had a look and we ticked all the boxes. The main box being that because the woodland was difficult to get to or the part of woodland where they were thinking of setting up an enclosure um, where it could be done, because it's so difficult to get to, we ticked highly on that the beavers wouldn't be easily persecuted. There were only two farmers in the whole of the county that, one, that had volunteered to be a site and we were the one that would be difficult for people to get to to persecute them. So that kind of told me a bit about how attitudes were across the land to introduce in beavers. But I'm only two miles up river from the town and I know that if our house was flooding and the neighbouring house within six hours, it could be as deep as um, kitchen counter height. Um, I knew that it, we couldn't be the only ones that people in town must be struggling to, but people in town don't have the access to land to deliver solutions. So, um, so as I say, I volunteered, but then we got into the realms of that there's no policy and framework in Wales. So NRW and Welsh Government don't have anything sort of strategically in place to work to. So any project that's put forward, it ends up, consuming so much time, public consultation, and therefore so much money that it just becomes non-void. Any funding pot that maybe was there soon isn't. So um, we didn't get to, we we didn't get to have the beaver enclosure, unfortunately, but um, and that didn't happen at all across the county. And um, instead I've volunteered our um, largest field, which is on the other side of the river. So in winter, I can't access it. It's large for us. It, we're only a small farm. It's 27 acres, so it's it's small by comparison to where I'm from down in the southeast originally. But um, that's now going to be a flood meadow with lots of scrapes and um, diverting water from the tributaries. And we're basically we're getting funding from Welsh government for quarter of a million pounds to do what beavers could do for a three acre enclosure. North Wales Wildlife Trust thinks could be at a cost of thirty thousand pounds. So while I'm glad I'm going to be delivering a solution, it's not going to be big enough to help um, sway people in wanting beavers on the land. Um, and it's not going to be big enough to hold enough water that I'll be able to help the local town. Um, but it is a step, at least a small step in the right direction. Um, talking to people in North Wales Wildlife Trust, they went out to Bavaria in 20. 2008 and that where they've had beavers reintroduced they've been there since the 1960s and there was a bit of negativity about it in the farmers union out there but they went back out this year and it's all positive feedback now that they've got working beaver groups and they've got staff who um, can help manage the dens and the dams and the ponds and the general message that they came back with was don't fear the beavers when you've got working beaver groups and you've got people on the ground and you've got farmers on the ground who can scrape the tops off of dams to let a bit more water out if the dam is, if the pond is becoming a problem. And um, yeah, the general feeling was don't fear the beavers, um, work with them. They've also noticed that now we're getting, they're getting more droughts in summertime that the crops and pasture are um, healthiest obviously where the water levels are kept higher so they've acknowledged that the negativity was more about a lack of staff and people on the ground and volunteers helping to make the beavers a success. Um, there have been surveys done um, across the farming community and I was really glad to hear that a third had a positive feedback about having beavers reintroduced um, a third were non plus just because they're not in the location that they're going to be sort of affected. And then 
a third were a bit cautious and half of that last third were really quite negative but their worries are about disease um beavers being vectors of disease um and um yeah the management of dams and ponds and the effect on their land but i think the main concern they had was about bovine tb um it's never far from many of our of our minds um in farm in livestock farming but there's not been a case of bovine TB found in a single beaver yet that's been tested. They'd also, the only part of the habitat they would share really would be the drinking points. And I've seen lots of farms have removed cattle from riverbanks by fencing them off and having water troughs and solar powered systems put in place. So I just think that there is, there's so much scope for solutions um, across the landscape. And like Chris said, we're the adults in the room and we can choose to make this work. I think also a bit of a safe to fail approach would really help if we have these working teams. I would love to see them. Uh, it would help It would help save the investment that we've put in in natural flood management. Um, and, and it would just, I, I can't imagine the insurance claims across towns that flood. All that soil is just being washed out. You can see it in the mouth of the river um, down on the seafront and obviously out to sea. And I just think that as farmers, if if we put a bit more of a, we all know the value of our land. But I just think if we wanted to protect it a bit more rather than sort of accept that there is erosion and that it can wash away, I think we could be a lot more sort of solutions focused and nature based solutions focused. So that's where I'm coming at. I got hindered by a lack of policy and framework to make any progress on my flood project. Natural flood management has ended up costing a whole lot more. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I look forward to questions. Thanks, um, that was a really interesting perspective, thank you. Um, okay, now we have Tom Bowser of the Argety Red Kite Project in Scotland. Um, so take it away, Tom. Again, I will pin you. <laughs> there we go. You should be able to show your screen. Thank you. Guys, um, right, just see if I can get this shared. Can you guys all see the screen okay? The slides okay? Excellent. Right, folks, so yeah. I'm going to tell you a bit about my farm, Argty, which is a 1,400-acre sheep and beef farm located on the Braes of Dune in central Scotland, about an hour north of Glasgow and Edinburgh. If you've heard of us before, it might be for our Red Kite project. We've got a feeding station on the farm, which my parents started in the late 90s. But more recently, we've gained additional fame slash notoriety for releasing beavers onto the farm. We hosted the first unenclosed authorised beaver release onto private land um, from November 2021. And for the next 15 minutes, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about why we did that, how we did that, and the changes that the beavers have brought to the farm. So why did we do it? In 2018, I visited my first ever be beaver wetland and it absolutely blew my mind. The air was thrumming with the sound of thousands of insects being drawn in by the dead wood and impounded water. Fish were rising again and again to feed upon them. Birds all filled the surrounding woodland. And at night, scores of bats were coming out and feeding on the insects. The whole place was brimming with sound and colour, kind of which I'd never experienced before. And all of it was thanks to the beavers who dammed a small stream and created this giant sprawling wetland, this total birthplace of life. And that landscape where some of the trees were standing in water and others were lying half felled but regrowing, that place that was so full of life, it was really strange to me. And that left me feeling both inspired and also quite angry. Angry because it, I thought the countryside I'd grown up with was rich, brimming with life and biodiversity. And um, suddenly I saw a beaver wetland and realized how wrong I'd been. And so from that point onwards, I was of the belief that we needed beavers back across the UK as quickly as we could. Um, now beavers returned to Scotland in 2001 from escapes from in private enclosures. 
And although they did cause some landowners issues, as Chris alludes to, in very, very specific circumstances, um, flat fields where uh, farmers farm right up to the water's edge in particular, they brought incredible environmental gains as well. And in recognition of that, in 2019, the Scottish Government granted beavers European protected status, which make it illegal to kill them or to disturb them or destroy the, their habitats. But although conservationists rejoiced at the news, there was a caveat in the arrangement. Landowners on prime agricultural land were allowed to apply for lethal control licenses when beavers were deemed to be causing unmanageable issues on their land. And in the first year of apparent protection, one in five of Scotland's beavers was culled under license. Some of them were causing issues, but sometimes land the donors were handed licenses simply for having beavers on their land with no site checks being done to see what the issues were or whether these could be dealt with by non-lethal means. Some of the licenses were handed over when landowners didn't even have beavers on their land. So massive uproar about this, made worse by the fact that SNH, as they were at the time, now Nature Scott, the government's nature agency, who issued the licenses, had themselves identified over 100,000 unoccupied hectares in Scotland, perfectly suitable for beavers. So they could have been relocated, but government policy said that um, that wasn't possible, that um, their populations could expand naturally, but when they came into conflict with people, they couldn't be moved to less contentious sites. So big uproar about that, a lot of pressure, and on the back of that, at last, the Scottish Government changed tack and agreed that if beavers were within range of a site, i.e. likely to make it to that site anyway, that place's managers or owners could apply to have beavers relocated to their land. And this is where we came into the story. So in January 2020, my friend the Scottish Wild Beaver Group trustee, James Nairn, came to see me on Argety. And we stood watching the red kites gather for their winter roost. And he put this question to me, which really changed the course of mine and my family's life. He said, Tom, do you know a landowner near here who might be willing to rehome beavers that might otherwise be killed? And I thought, oh, God, here we go. Because I knew that beavers were important. Um, I knew I really believed in them, but I also knew that this would prove to be unpopular with some of our farming neighbours and friends in the wider farming community. But nonetheless, I knew that I wanted to do this very badly from the moment that he spoke those words. I knew that we would go for it, um, popularity be damned. So we took the plunge and we entered this world of beavers and bureaucracy. Now, beavers, I think, represent a symbol of hope. I think um, that as climate, uh, the environment crisis gets worse and worse, they look like one of the few options we have to mitigate against the damage. And thankfully, when we began our consultations on the proposal of moving beavers to the farm, hundreds, literally hundreds of people agreed with us. So we got support of people from across the local community, local schools, universities, community groups. The wildlife community supported us as well. All the ENGOs wrote supporting letters backing our proposals. And against that, we had five landowners who had concerns and then National Farmers Union up here and Scottish Land and Estates also made things really very difficult for us. But an overwhelming landslide victory for the idea of moving beavers rather than killing them. We, we completed our consultation and submitted the application and we waited and we waited with no word back as to when we might get a decision. Things were complicated by the fact that Nature Scott had been taken to court by the charity Trees for Life um, about their beaver cull policy, and this just gummed the whole thing up. Um, it felt like everybody was waiting to see what the outcome of that would be before any moves would be made on beavers, which kind of gives an idea of quite how hard it is to restore these animals across Britain. But eventually the verdict came and the press went with a victory for Trees for Life the Scottish Greens came into power around that time as well. And suddenly with a beaver supportive politician in the hot seat, things changed for us. And at last, after months of waiting, we got our decision. Beavers are really important species and they can really manipulate landscapes. This is very important from not only a whole host of water retention benefits, but they're creating habitat for a whole series of species. 
In some parts of Scotland, you've got highly modified agricultural systems, but beavers, when they return to these kind of habitats, can cause impacts on farming especially. We've had opportunities to go in and trap and translocate these animals, and that's a really positive step forward. So today is a crucial step. Um, it's a licensed condition to make sure these animals are healthy, free from disease before they're released. Up until this point, we've not been able to release beavers in Scotland. So animals that I've translocated have gone down to England. However, why this project is so exciting is this will be the first time we've released beavers again in Scotland since the Scottish beaver trial. So, you know, you're talking about 10, 12 years ago. This is the first time a landowner has applied to relocate beavers onto their land. So this is a really positive step and it's really a unique step in the beaver translocation story. So it started with Scottish Wild Beaver Group who approached me to ask if I knew any landowners new here who might be willing to take a beaver, it would be I called otherwise and release them on ponds on their land. And I said, yeah, we might know one person that might be mad enough to do that. So I do hope that this small step will be a catalyst for getting beavers spreading across the country. We need as many beavers as we can possibly manage to have in Scotland. What you see today, as soon as we release them, they've just melted into this landscape. This really is an animal that was here widespread. I think this is a really good news story. And to have a family group that, you know, have been trapped together, kept together, and then we can relocate them together, that in itself is special. I mean, you see three very healthy kits here. So, you know, this has been a really emotional day. Very happy. We know that we need beavers. But the moment beavers really need us as well, I think that's an important thing. You know, they're very reliant on our goodwill and hopefully more people doing this sort of thing. Pause just a second to reflect on the greatest headline ever written in the history of the English language. So, now beavers are on Arctic and their impact has been huge. Our waterways are expanding and diversifying and water is flowing in places that have been dry for centuries. Insects feed on the sap of beaver nod trees. Amphibians swim and breed in the beaver dug canals. Herons wait there for the chance of spearing food. In last summer's heat wave, while all of our other ponds dwindled away to nothing as the, as the hot weather endured, the beavers did something very clever. In order to get the depth of water they wanted, they dredged the bottom of the pond, pushing up these big mountains of mud and creating canal systems through the waters. And in doing so, they provided this oasis in this ever expanding desert and they kept thousands of species alive. Last winter, we saw the other side of climate change when it felt like it would never stop raining. And thanks to the beavers, we weathered those storms as well. So see the um, outflow stream from this pond, which is where we've relocated our second family of beavers. Thus far, we've moved 14 of them to the farm.
this outflow stream, tiny thing, you can step across it, no bother at all, but because it's fed from the hills and comes tumbling downhill from there, in previous winters, this is what happens. Grew into a torrent, washed away our farm track just adjacent to the stream here, washed down through our fields, washed through our sheds, trashed any equipment that was left on the floor in the sheds. Well, last winter was the first time that that stream didn't burst out, it didn't wash away the track, and it didn't trash everything in our sheds. And when you consider that in wet winters, prior to the beavers arriving and damming uphill from there, we were probably repairing that track about four or five times a year. So a contractor fee, maybe four or 500 pounds each time just to repair a track that would wash away again. You can see the difference the beavers make. This time-lapse video, I'd like you just to look at the bottom left-hand corner of the beaver pond here to show you how this pond changed through the hot summer and into the wet winter. So this is it in February 22 when this beaver family arrived. This is us going into the heat wave there. See the still water in the pond above the dam to the right. So when the rain started, and this is how much water was stored on the place in the winter time. From the top main dam alone, scientists at Stirling University estimate that we've stored an extra million litres of water. And the beavers have brought other benefits to our farm and to our business as well. We now start running beaver watching tours through the summer. Five people usually on a tour paying £50 a night. And it sounds a bit crass to talk about money, but equally, if we don't talk about money, then some expert who's never tried their hand at any kind of wildlife tourism will say that you can't make money from it and everyone will believe them. You can make money from it. You can make much better money, I think, in most places from having beavers than from not having them. We've also recently been extend, accepted as one of only 21 applicants that got through for a massive grant scheme where we're going to be setting aside our waters from livestock, fencing them off and planting them up to create incredible habitat for a number of species and will mean that there's space for the beavers to expand and bring their benefits across the farm. Benefits to the insects, to the amphibians, even to the trees. And there are two things that I find particularly exciting about having beavers on our land again. The first is that my daughters will grow up in a landscape that's becoming richer in wildlife, when for previous generations, all we've known is declines. It would be normal for them to have beavers here to see a landscape improving. And the second thing is that for this summer and the previous year, we've had beaver kits born on this land, which are probably the first beaver kits to arrive here at least 400 years anyway. Nobody knows quite when beavers went extinct in Scotland. All we know is that really their problem was that they were too valuable. They weren't a pest, they weren't considered a pest. It was because their pelts and their custodium was so valuable that they were killed off. So all these years of miserable history where we've been without beavers and nature has been declining, we're reversing all of that as we restore beavers across Britain. And it's really exciting to be a small part of that. And I'd like to finish just by saying what my hopes would be now for the future with beaver restoration in Britain. Fortunately, in Scotland, government position has completely changed with the arrival of the Greens into power. And now we have a strategy that will allow beavers to be relocated to successful applications all across the country. So people can apply and see if they can move them into entirely new catchments as Cairngorms National Park are doing at the moment when we think that only a few years ago you couldn't even move them five miles without a lot of difficulty. It's a real change. I think the public is behind these animals. I think they recognise that these the beavers offer us so much hope and are so important and can do things that we humans can't possibly even imagine. And my main hope really for farming and for the unions, their representatives, is that they recognise that beavers are likely to come anyway. It's an inevitability in Scotland, and I think it will be in England as well. All it will take is sympathetic politicians in power that aren't blocking the public will on this, and I think we'll see beavers back being widespread across the countries. So I hope that rather than fighting this unwinnable war against that, that the unions recognise that this is going to happen, that actually farming more than anything else, any other business, 
relies upon a healthy, stable environment and beavers bring that. I hope that they lobby not to stop beaver spreading, but instead to see their members benefit from this, be incentivized to store beavers on their land and to boost biodiversity. Those would be my main hopes. Thank you for listening, guys, and look forward to the questions. Thank you, Tom. That was really, really interesting. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for sharing your stories and insights. Um, I hope everyone's enjoyed that as much as I did. Um, we've got about half an hour actually for um, a Q and A. So um, let's get into it now, Chris. I know I've seen that you've answered some of these questions in the chat in the Q and A chat already, but I'm going to ask you them again just so everyone can have the opportunity to hear the answer because there's some really interesting questions. So let's start with um, first of all, how much land do you need? That's quite a good one to start with. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, mean, I think the bigger the enclosure can be, the better. But I think the, the really critical thing, if they're going to be enclosed, it's the length of stream that you've got. We're very, very lucky. I mean, ours is quite a small site. It's five acres and about 200 metres of stream. But it happens to be a very rich little area in terms of vegetation. So they've done they're nowhere near eating themselves out of house and home uh, yet. Um, in nature, they would want to have a, a territory, maybe a kilometre, maybe a couple of kilometres long, um, uh, which they, they'd be able to move up and down and a lot further than they can. But I, I would think if you if you thought about um, my kind of size of site as being a minimum, um, and then uh, the, the 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 bigger you can make it, the better. Length of stream, though, I think is probably the critical factor, uh, and and the 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 complexity of the vegetation there. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, following on from that, really, um, what about migratory fish species such as salmon and sea trout? Um, well, Rob Needham from Beaver Trust actually did a, a, a great study about that up in um, uh, in Scotland uh, a few years ago. Uh, but broadly speaking, from what I see here on my site is that every dam has got a, a stream going around the edge of it. So what, once once the dam has been built up enough to, to reach the top of the bank, the water's got to go somewhere. And essentially, it goes around and creates a new stream running around the outside. And uh, these these function the same way as a fish ladder would, for example, on a conventional man-made dam. Uh, and the fish can progress through the site really well. And I think the point about that is that, that, that young fish, uh, freshly spawned, uh, um, what do you call them, a, a fry, can get into those dams very easily. And once you're in there, they're in the most fabulous uh, fish nurseries full of food and with lots of cover and fish fry tend to grow really fast um and what we've certainly seen as well is it within the dams the fish that we have um the trout which are in there uh, have all grown much bigger than um before the beavers arrived could i chip in a wee bit from um some of our experience up here as well maybe on that so um, in Scotland, there's been a lot of concern that um, beaver dams might stop um, migratory fish species from reaching their spawning grounds. And I think we can't say with absolute certainty that that's not going to be an issue in certain circumstances. If there was you know, a particularly steep stream, a particularly big dam and low water, it could be a problem, but it'd be very specific circumstances. But Meanwhile, there's a growing body of science that's showing exactly the sort of benefits that Chris is talking about. Um, you know, the um, dams trapping a lot of runoff and producing these clear pools downstream from them. Um, we've got the beavers felling trees over water and providing more shade and shelter for fish there from predators and from the heat and the climate change years. We've been doing some interesting work with Stirling University as well on some of this, looking at how the pools are um, creating cooler water downstream from dams as well, which kind of makes sense, really. You know, it takes a um, longer to boil a full kettle of water than it does to um, boil a partially full kettle. And, um, you know, so if you've got beavers creating these deep pools, the sun won't be penetrating right down to the bottom of them and heating the whole water. 
and you'll get this slow release of cool water coming downstream from the dam, which will benefit fish species as well. And I think the other thing as well is that you, what we're seeing at the moment with climate change is mm -hmm. having these big washout rainfalls that can just wash away an entire year's fish stock in one go. But beavers are creating this complexity through their wetlands, which will reduce the risk of that because water will have to work harder to get through the wetland system. So with luck, you know, we won't have the young fish being washed out by them. So I think we can't discount some of the concerns, but equally, I think um, that people concerned about fish would be unwise to discount all these benefits. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, one that I've just seen that um, I think I would like answer because I think it's a good one. It says, are there any considerations for beavers and TB, um, e.g. badgers being attracted to water sources to drink and harboring diseases, etc.? Uh, <laughs> well, certainly I have never heard of any evidence at all uh, about uh, beavers uh, um, have, uh, ha having TB. Uh, and now uh, scores of beavers have been caught on the River Tay. They all get uh, thoroughly vetted. And uh, as far as I'm aware, Tom, don't know if you heard any different, yeah. uh, they're all clean as a whistle as far as TB is concerned. Yeah, so I mean, when beavers were moved to us, our project partners, Beaver Trust and Five Sisters Zoo, did a thorough health screening on them to check um, to see um, they were safe to be moved to a new area. So um, I've certainly never heard about the TB thing. Bless an issue up with us because we don't thankfully have TB in this area. Um, but yeah, they will be thoroughly health screened before being moved anywhere. Um, I know that in Wales, Welsh Government vets have put in a report to Welsh Government that no beavers have been found carrying TB. And so it isn't to worry and that actually here in Wales, 85% of TB is cattle to cattle, only 15% is wildlife and 0% of that is beavers. And we do have beavers out in the wild, even it's just kept a bit quiet because they're not legally protected. Thank you, guys. Um, we now have a question for Sam. Um, have you worked with the Wales Beaver Project? And if so, what was your experience? Yeah, so the Wales Beaver Project is on Cors Dovey, is at Cors Dovey, so that's on the Dovey River where there were actually already beavers there. So they basically built, because uh, I've, I've had quite a lot of dealings with Adrian Lloyd-Jones and with Alicia, who were, both were the forerunners on that project through North Wales Wildlife Trust. And there were already beavers there, so they, they kind of just built an enclosure around the den and around the ponds so it wasn't a reintroduction as such so that's where it was different to what I wanted to do and what others want to do where we want to have them translocated into the landscape because they were already there it was a much easier permit and license to obtain. Thank you. Um, this is a bit more of a general question for all of you, um, whoever wants to answer it. Um, how many beavers can be kept in an enclosure? Is there a control plan or will they naturally just sort of balance out? Um, the uh, young beavers typically would leave home uh, when they get to about two years old. And so uh it, it's a it's a, a management kind of requirement really that you um catch these young animals these two-year-olds and then uh, they need to then get moved off to other projects um if they remain there they may uh, come into conflict with their parents much like any teenager staying at home for too long my thoughts exactly um okay next question um I believe this is for you tom does forestry and land scotland consider having beavers on their land most of the flooding on our land comes from forestry plantations that's a really good question there's been some really interesting threads on whether forestry practices are um yeah causing problems downstream um so forestry and land scotland hosted the scottish beaver trial the official beaver trial which took place from 2009 in Scotland and have been pretty quiet on everything since they have some beavers on some of their some of their land I say their land um, for those of you out with Scotland forestry and land Scotland manage 
land on behalf of the Scottish people. So technically it's our land really. But um, this year, finally, they have applied with no consultation done to relocate beavers to two of their sites where the animals are already within range. Um, and this is after an awful lot of public pressure, again, a lot more lobbying um, from various rewilding groups to try and say, look, you know, beavers are being shot still in Tayside in big numbers when we could be moving them to what's essentially our land. So they've taken in some, but um, one of the big disappointments has been that these public land managers, such as them and Nature Scott, haven't put their hats in the ring and actually you know, used this land for the public good that they say they're managing it for. I think it's really interesting to look at the forestry practices and general upland management practices and really now I think, you know, consider how, how we protect the best low-lying farmland starting at the hills, trying to take a more holistic view and saying, you know, are we doing enough in the streams tributaries to slow down the flow of water as climate change intensifies? And yeah, I'm sure forestry has a big part to play in that conversation. Thank you very much. Um, next question. Um, does the soil type affect beavers? This particular question is from someone who is on heavy clay. Well, our valley is full of very, very heavy clay. It's basically China clay. Um, and it doesn't seem to hold them up one iota. Uh, I, I can't see it being a problem at all. And in fact, I guess that the, the, the dams will just hold water that much better. If they're uh, if they're sitting on clay. Okay, thank you. Um, can beavers build dams in heavily incised channels, or do they require more of a gradual bank slope in order for the dam to be stable? No. Well, I I, th I think I don't know what you you've seen, Tom, but as far as I can see, they don't seem to care if it's a uh, if it's a deeply incised um, thing or not. The the main the main thing is that they can get something established um, before you get really really heavy rain down down through there. Some of the dams we have are very steeply incised bits, and some aren't. And um, yeah, they're 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 all pretty strong. Um, I guess it depends a bit on on the, the size and the flow regime of the river uh, of the stream that we're talking about. I don't know what you've seen, Tom. Yeah, I think that's an important point to make which um, I should have possibly said earlier. Um, but um, yeah, I've seen dams like Chris in all sorts of different places. Um, but beavers won't always dam. It's an important point to make. Um, they'll dam when they think that impounding the water will work, that, you know, if they're on, say, a big, um, the, the main body of a river, no dam's going to stop the power of that river coming down, so they won't even try. They'll dam to create the depth of water they want to keep the entrances to their lodges and burrows submerged, to keep themselves safe and hidden from predators that are no longer actually in Britain, but they still fear things like lynx and wolves and bears. So to give them that 60 centimetres at least that will keep them hidden. And also if there's a likelihood that their ponds are going to freeze up, um, they would. there's a possibility they would dam to protect the food caches that they build up over winter by digging sticks into the bottom of the pond, which the pond will basically act like a fridge, keeping their food supply safe. So if the pond freezes up, um, they'll be able to swim underwater and get to the sticks. And it's really important they have that stability of water in um, winter conditions, because if suddenly you've got a spate coming down, it could wash away their food supply, then the pond freezes up, they wouldn't be able to get out from below the ice and get any food above there. So all these things are kind of conditions that they need um, in order to actually build a dam in the first place. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Are there any suggestions from any of the panel about getting help with the licenses? Um, what are the prospects of the license being granted and how long does an application take? I suppose it depends, Mary, on where the uh, person is looking to apply from. I think, um, yeah, everyone's advice would be different depending on what country the person's in. Can the person who sent that question in please specify where they're coming from and we will come back to you? 
Um, okay, let's move on to something else. Um, going back to the enclosed beavers, is culling required ever? Ooh, in an enclosure? Yes, that's the question. No. Why would you do that? You know, these are really rare animals. Uh, and they are so impactful if they're allowed to get and do their job. Yeah, you know, that would be an why would you ever do that? That would be an absolute last resort. No. Okay. <laughs> that's a good answer, thank you. I think there's so um, many available sites throughout Britain, yeah. <laughs> You know, the point is to allow beavers to spread throughout Britain. I would say enclosures, possibly for avoidance of doubt, aren't the best solution. Uh, you know, most of us, I think, would much rather have free living beavers throughout Britain, most of the, all, of our, all the panellists. But it's the best option for keeping beavers that have come into conflict in prime agricultural areas of Scotland alive is to move them to enclosures in England or hope that people apply for them up here to move them to be free living. So yeah, definitely not killing them when they're in the enclosure. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we've got um, a location of the person with the licenses question. It is the north of England. So, Chris? Well, um, um, some people uh, apply for licenses by themselves. Uh, some people, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just temper that. You would need either to be an ecologist or have an ecologist um, able to come and do some work for you. Um, some people go to Beaver Trust. Some people go to Derek Gow. Uh, I think um, there, there are a variety of, of people who who, uh, who could uh, get a licence. Um, so, yeah. Um, but be, be, Beaver Trust would be very, very happy to do it for you, I'm sure. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, we are all aware of sewage discharge in rivers. How do beaver communities fare in such circumstances? I think well, there's been a few places. Oh, yeah, sorry, you, you go, go talk first. No, no, after you, Chris, on you go, you'll know more. Well, I, I was going to say, uh, um, I suppose a simple answer is I, I don't know. Uh, my, what I would say is from what I've seen is that the beavers are pretty robust animals, but I mean, who wants to live in a sewage outfall uh, if, if it's if it's really serious? Uh, it, it's, it's got to have an impact, I think. Um, but I, having said that, I've heard in Bavaria of beavers actually blocking up um, sewage farms and that kind of thing. So so maybe they're robust enough not, not to mind too much. But it can't be good, can it? Mom, did you have anything to add? No, I was going to say, I think there's some examples up here of beavers living um, near sewage outflows um, and surviving okay. Um, as Chris says, it's probably not the ideal place, but um, after a while when beavers are in a catchment, they'll have taken up all the best habitats and the nicest places, so sometimes I guess needs must. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, do beavers prefer to live in lowland areas or are they also happy in upland areas? I would say they're pretty adaptable, wouldn't you, Chris? I mean, um, <laughs> we've got them... the spectrum right here, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. true. Um, I mean, I think beavers generally would, um, we see them, um, on main river stems as well. If banks are friable and suitable for burrowing, they can live there. Um, I would guess generally they would probably prefer side channels and ponds and slow flowing water um, to being on the main stem of the river. But I suppose it really probably more than anything else would depend on what the habitat is like around it as to where they're likely to uh, want to set up. Um, you know, if there's good surrounding habitat, that's where they're going to want to be. Plenty of um, broadleaf trees that they can nibble, etc. And um, banks that are suitable for their burrowing. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I don't know where this one came from, but it says, what is the current funding for beaver enclosures? Do we need to specify location? Well, um, uh, there is nothing formal, uh, really. Um, although if you're lucky enough to live in a, in a protected landscape in England, you might be able to get money out of FIPPLE. Uh, which is farming and protected landscapes. Um, uh, 
Uh, and I know a couple of um, places in Cornwall where they have that and Fipple paid considerable amounts of, towards the enclosure. Enclosures are bloody expensive. There's no doubt about that. And uh, we did ours with crowdfunding. Um, and and yeah, the sooner we get beyond this this enclosure thing, the better. Yeah, totally. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for you, Sam. Um, do you have an inkling as to why beavers are not recognised as legally native in Wales? Uh, I think looking back through the press and talking and talking to um, those on the Wales Beaver Project, there was quite a strong voice um, from farmers unions back in 2017, 2018, um, that beavers could cause damage to properties and also that they would negatively affect fish stocks in our rivers. So, uh, yeah, I think I think it's a backlash from that. And also I've been in meetings where Welsh Water aren't keen on having them because if they do have, if they do set up home near an outlet, there could be a concentration of nutrients. Um, so yeah, I've been in meetings where Welsh Water don't don't really want to see them back on our waterways. Um, and then I have heard negative feedback from farmers unions. I have an inkling those two are the main reasons. Perfect, thank you. Um, this one is for Tom. Um, what caused the problems on the River Tay? Did they escape an enclosure or were they released? Okay, so the first, there's been a lot of confusion about this. It's a pretty murky history and it's actually Derek's book that first really properly shed light on what we think really happened. But there's a wildlife park near the River Urn which had beavers um, with a perimeter fence uh, around the whole pond and then an electric fence around inside that. Beavers apparently knocked down a tree that connected the electric fence to the perimeter fence. When the zookeeper stepped over the stile, she got a massive electric shock. Carrots went skywards and um, she turned off the fence, hobbled off home for four days. And when she came back, having not told anyone that the fence was off, the beavers were gone. So this in 2001 seems to be when beavers returned to Britain after an absence of so many hundred years, um, or returned to Scotland, I should say, after an absence of so many hundred years. And um, from there afterwards, there'll have been more escapes from private enclosures. But there's always been this feeling in the farming community that um, the sole reason that we have beavers back in Scotland is because people have deliberately released them. Um, but with no real evidence to back that up, that it's actually been in any way a kind of deliberate attack. Um, but yeah, the issue really came from the fact that um, from the urn, um, the water flows then to the Tay, which is the longest river that we have in Scotland. And next to that is some of our very rare up here, good farmland where you can uh, produce arable crops. And I think really... Um, the issue was a few things, but um, sometimes there was stealing produce from some of the veg fields, um, but um, sometimes they were damming in drainage ditches or burrowing into flood banks and in one way or another putting quite valuable fields underwater. So in some respects, you know, this was the very worst place for beavers to begin their recolonization of this country from because the potential for conflict was the highest. Then in the other, on the other hand, you could say that, you know, conflict was likely to ensue anywhere and that actually the Tay, because it's so well connected, was the best place if you want beavers back across Scotland. So it all entirely depends on your perspective. But as Chris said earlier, if you're on flat land farming up to the water's edge, beavers can cause real problems. Um, and this is where all this came from. But I think what happened next was a real kind of fudge of the truth from a lot of people in farming um, that was swallowed a bit too readily by politicians where, you know, a lot of this land isn't being used to produce things that directly feed us. You know, a lot of it's going into whiskey production or being turned into biscuits, you know, non-essential things really, as much as I like whiskey. Um, but beavers were culled in such big numbers on the basis that they were threatening food security. And really, you have to question how that could possibly be true, given what's grown in so many of those fields, given how much food we waste in this country, et cetera, et cetera. Really, a beaver's going to threaten food security? I don't think so. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's been an interesting start for them to begin to come back across Scotland. Certainly not without its problems, but I would really hope that we can move beyond that and you know have more conflict-free return to other catchments in Britain from now on. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then another one for Sam. Um, where did you get the information for the survey of farmers? Oh, where I get all my information in Wales, the Wales Beaver Project. And again, Adrian Lloyd-Jones. I'm sure um, I can't get him off the phone whenever I've got a question, so I'm sure he'd be happy to answer anyone's questions on it. But yeah, that was the third of farmers um, were positive about the reintroduction of them. A third were non-plus just because they're not on waterways. And then a th half of the last third that were concerned were um against it so really you know only a sixth of farmers out the ones that were surveyed but yeah so that's from the wales beaver project amazing thank you um we've got time for one more question and i think it's a really nice one to finish with um and i hope all three of you will be able to contribute something to it um so the question is what does the panel think needs to change to encourage broader support for beavers from the farming community education Go on, Chris. <laughs> Chris, you're on mute. I, I think that um, uh, we need to get a lot more familiarity. I, I work uh, quite a bit with the NFU down here in the southwest, and I, I had a visit from their regional staff, and the, the regional policy guy and the, the Cornwall County advisor um, they both have beavers, wild beavers, living on their farms. So, so straight away, you, you're you're on a winner there because they actually live with it. They live in landscapes which aren't likely to have uh, any serious problems, and so they're quite cool about the whole thing. And that that um, transmits down through the local farming fraternity very slowly, but it, it does do that. Um, uh, if I was if I was trying to sell beavers in the fens, I would yeah. deserve to have my ass kicked. You know that is not the place, frankly. Any river attached to that, you'll just see a repeat of the Tay, um, and and rightly so, because that is the last landscape that you want to put them in. We've got so much scope for beavers in this country, so much scope. So let's do the good bits, shall we? And and, and keep away from the where, where we're going to cause a ruck. Um, I think that some sort of message like that would probably ease tension a little bit with NFU. What I do get from them, uh, absolutely, there is, is that farmers want to have the ability to um, manage troublesome beavers when they want to. And um, I can understand that, being a farmer myself. And the, the trick, the, the trick, I think, is going to be in uh, in um, making sure that, that doesn't end up in a, a, a free for all of gunfire. Um, you know, that's what we've got to that's what we've got to avoid. These animals are too precious. There will come a time. Look, in, in Bavaria, there's about twenty five thousand beavers living wild there, and about two thousand get shot every year. But that's an outstanding conservation success. Because the beavers are really widespread, the farmers are being kept happy because uh, the, the, uh, the troublesome beavers are being removed. So everyone's a winner, and I think we should we should kind of be a, a, a bit relaxed about that. But we're a long way away from that happy situation where we've got lots of beavers. Um, yeah, th those are kind of my 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 thoughts on it, really. I think I would um, agree with those points. I think two things really need to happen. I think that um, farming and farming representatives have to realise that um, the environment and biodiversity aren't sort of nice, desirable things, but something that farming actually relies on. Um, and that if it continues to fall as it is, then we're going to be in real trouble. I think as well that our politicians need to in some way be able to answer the question that none of them have thus far been able to answer which is really about local pain versus national gain you know 
when a farmer says like why should i be hitting the pocket so that then my, by you know fields being flooded so that then the neighbors don't get flooded or you know the town downstream doesn't get flooded no one has been able to really answer that so i think there's such an obvious middle ground here which conservation and farming could lobby for with new post eu subsidies of saying okay farmers should be paid for storing water on their land they should be paid for boosting biodiversity on their land but it's going to take a position shift from farming to really understand that this is important to them as well as to conservation and to really try and pull in the same direction i think it, it's also going to take a, a recognition by ministers certainly in england anyway those functions which they've all talked about actually need to be properly built into the new uh, farm support um you know be beavers could be the most fabulous tool for restoration of wildlife i'll shut up now, Scott. Sam. no it's very true eh? it's guys um before I close this off I'm just going to do one more thing I'm just going to launch a poll quickly to ask you all um whether you are in favour of beaver reintroductions across Britain and I will then I'm hoping you guys can see that um yes you can okay good um so I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists this evening I think judging by the chat it's it's been very well received, a really, really fascinating discussion, and I'm glad that we had a lot of time for Q&A at the end. So, yeah, I hope all you attendees have enjoyed it, have learned something, and uh, are leaving feeling positive about beavers. Um, so, yeah, just a reminder that the recording will be made available to watch after the event, and 97% of attendees are in favour. So that's fantastic. Um, I hope you will have a really nice evening and I'm going to stop recording now. So yeah, thank you so much for coming.